sanctuary. Wherever we are in the building, let's stand to our feet as we prepare to go before the very mercy seat and throne of God together in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, in glory, we bless you, we praise you. Because, God, you are a very present help in the time of trouble. God, we've made it as a people, not because there hasn't been trouble, but because you've gotten in between what the adversary meant for us. Father, we want to say thank you for covering and keeping and sustaining and redeeming. We thank you for delivering and holding and strengthening. We thank you right now for where you've brought us from. But God, we declare we ever needed you before. With all that's happening in this world, in our society, in our culture, in our communities, in our homes, and in our families, God, we need you right now, and we can't make it without you. And so we pray that your power will continue to manifest itself in this place. We come to hear from heaven right now, so speak and save and heal and transform. Get the glory for yourself. We promise to praise you. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. And all God's children said amen, amen, and thank God. Hallelujah. As we continue to stand all over the sanctuary, would that you would grab your Bible, turn it through to Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, beginning reading in the first verse. Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, beginning reading in the first verse. And while you're finding that particular pastor of Scripture, I want to remind you that we've been preaching throughout the months of January and February from the general theme, play to your strengths. And I want to focus in our sermonic spotlight beginning in verse number one, chapter number six, and Nehemiah, as it appears on the screen, even though we're inside, I want you to use your outside voice and come on, let's read collectively. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they were all trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Amen. Thus far, the word of God, that preaches itself, doesn't it? Look at somebody to you, let us say, Neighbor, pastor's going to preach about the danger of distraction. Tell another person on the other side, say, neighbor, if he didn't like that title, he's going to preach about keep your kingdom focus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your cooperation. May I take your seats. Presence of the Lord as the Spirit does speak and God does God. I want to use as a subject the danger of distractions, a.k.a. keep your kingdom focus. Brothers and sisters, in Homer's The Odyssey, the protagonist finds himself trying to steer clear of danger. Of course, you know that the siren songs have been luring sailors 
from the safety of the waters to try to arrive on the shores only to be de destroyed by the rocks beneath the surface. This, this, this tragedy of men hearing these beautiful songs and being drawn unwittingly into danger. What was known to Odysseus, and as a consequence, he formulated a plan. He, he had the sailors on board to have their ears filled with beeswax. And even though he himself did not have his ears filled, he had them to tie him to the mast of the ship and order them that no matter what he said, they were not to loose his ropes. And certainly as they sailed past the island, they heard the song, or rather they didn't hear the song because the beeswax prevented it from penetrating their eardrums. He heard the song, but he could do nothing about it. And as a consequence, they were all able to sail safely past the danger of the distraction that was designed to bring them to their destruction. And if you can't tell, I'm preaching already. <laughs> because just as distractions were dangerous and destructive then, likewise today, the adversary uses distractions to try to destroy the purpose of the people of God. So, brothers and sisters, whether you realize it or not, every day that God allows you to live, you live under the constant assault of distraction. Now, in Scripture, uh, 1 John refers to these distractions as temptations, and he puts them in three categories. He says that we got to be careful about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But brothers and sisters, there's some stuff that distracts you that ain't necessarily sin that you enjoy. It's sin that gets under your skin. Just trying to see who I'm talking to. Is there anybody that doesn't mind admitting that there's some stuff that bothers you? But like, like the pet peeve that your spouse continues to do despite how many times you done told them, the, the microaggressions that you experience when simply trying to return the, the, the shirt in the store, that coworker that is constantly underperforming and then trying to claim credit for what you do, that, that there are some legitimate fears about what might happen if things don't go according to their plan. All I'm trying to say is that every day all of us wake up with a thousand things that have the capacity to pull us into a mental rabbit hole and cause us to spiral down in worry or in rage. And most importantly, their desire is to alter our plans from purpose to petty and from destiny to distraction. So I came today to sound the alarm about the silent, sinister enemy called distraction. Now listen, it's been said before and it's true, uh, confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. And so before you say too much, make sure that there is a distance between where you are now and where you were then, less folks can't figure out what's happening currently in your life. So, so confession time, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I'm on my way down to a meeting at the White House, and uh, in driving down there, uh, there, there was an instance of road rage. And, uh, in all frankness, all the rage was not just in the other car. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And, and, and as fate would happen, we ended up at the stoplight. And it was at that moment 
where I was prepared to step out of my car and handle business. When I realized, Ben, that I had on my dress hard sole shoes that have never been good for business handling. You understand what I'm saying? And, and when I, I realized I had on my dress shoes, I got mad, and then I realized why I had them on, it's because I was on my way to the White House. And, and I came back to myself, and thankfully for me and for him, stayed in the car. <laughs> I, I share this because every day, all of us live under the threat of being sucked into some drama, pulled off course, or entangled in some foolishness that is neither healthy nor holy. Do I have help in this house? <laughs> come, come, come on, don't, don't leave me out here by myself. I, I need some real people in here to acknowledge I'm saved, but there's still some street in me. I'm holy but there's still some hood residual in my life. I love God, but there's still a little ghetto. If you push me and catch me on the wrong day at the wrong time, it can go left for everybody. Y'all acting like y'all saved to the bone and sanctified to the marrow. But I've seen some of y'all cuss the Christians out on the parking lot of the Kingdom Fellowship Church. I need somebody in here to be acknowledging of the fact that distractions are always available. Tell somebody there's a person that lives on the inside of me that's always trying to take the wheel. Come on, tell the truth. They're always open for business. They don't have to get ready because they stay ready. They're easily provoked. They always overreact. They are looking for the smoke. In fact, they carry the smoke. They're smoke carriers. They're, they're looking for somebody. I wish he would. I wish he would say something to me. Or is that just me? The point is that when you feel that, you tell yourself, well, I'm just keeping it real. No, that's not really who you are. That's your lowest self. But you're more than that. But you got to recognize who's on the end. Okay, y'all still. So I just want to say this sermon would be three minutes faster if y'all had to go on ahead and tell the truth. But since y'all didn't, I'm going to have to pause and break it down one more time. Um, so so y'all remember that first Avengers movie, the Marvel movie, and at the end of the movie, um, uh, the, the aliens are coming down and they have these horrific uh, ships. And, and all of a sudden, uh, David Banner shows up, Dr. David Banner. You know, he's really the Hulk. And, 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 and the, the alien ship is coming right at him, and Captain America looks over to him, and he says, uh, Dr. Banner, this might be a really, really good time to get angry. <laughs> Dr. Banner looked back at him and said, that's my secret. I'm always angry. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, most of us live at the end of a hair trigger. It takes one word, it takes one thought, one memory, one glance. Folk don't even have to look, say nothing to you. If you just think they looked at you wrong, you ready to put down your religion. But that's why you got to stay prayed up. That's why you got to stay steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain that's in the Lord. I need somebody in here to co-sign on the fact that's why I'm glad God, God got a hold of me. I'm glad I'm saved. And somebody else ought to be thanking God that I'm saved because it would have gone another way if God's hand was not on my life. Who am I preaching to? Is there anybody here that knows you ain't perfect, you don't have it all together? 
other, but Lord knows he's brought you a mighty long way. You are growing in grace and developing as a disciple and matriculating in ministry. Is there anybody here that knows that if you allow God, he'll keep you if you want to be kept? He's a keeper. Somebody say, yes, he is. All, all I'm trying to get you to see, brothers and sisters, it is that all of us, if we're not careful, will get caught up in the destructive ways of distraction. That's the little lesson that I learned when I peered into this passage found in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, wherein we find Nehemiah, the Bible says, having already convinced the people that the way that he found the walls of Jerusalem did not have to stay. For those who are Bible students, you recall that when Nehemiah first arrived on the scene, he found the wall of the temple torn asunder. It, it was so bad that it was like one stone was no longer sitting upon another. But the Bible says after a three-day study of the project, he came back to the people and said, y'all, we can rebuild it. And here's what the Bible says, and the people had a mind to work. And, and so now by the time you catch them in, in, in Nehemiah 6, the Bible says the construction process and project has been going well, so much so that now the whole wall has been rebuilt and the only thing left to do is to restore the doors that hang in the 12 gates of the city. And it was at this point, help me Holy Ghost, that the Bible says that Sanballat, somebody saying Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the, the Arab, these three who don't normally rock together, got together to try to stop what God was doing. Ain't it something how people who don't like each other will come together because they don't like you? <laughs> here it is. Here it is. Bible says that, that they get together, watch this, and they send him a message. Come, watch this. You can't beat the Bible Come and meet with us in the plains of Oh No. Literally, the place is called Oh No. <laughs> That's just bad plating, <laughs> right? And, 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 and I want you to hear this because what they're really doing is sending Nehemiah an invitation to distraction. They, they, they don't want to see what God is doing happen in his life. But they don't come out and say it. What they do is come up with a cover story. Oh, oh just come and talk with us. Can we talk for a minute? Yeah, yeah, they're trying to get him to come and talk, but the Bible says, but they had my demise in mind. Watch this. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that, that he responds to them, oh, no, no, no. I can't meet with you. He says, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. See, see, listen, brothers and sisters, one easy way to tell whether something is destination or distraction is to consider whether it is constructive or destructive. <sighs> Try that again. You weren't ready. I said one way to discern whether something is destination or or distraction is to determine whether it is destructive or constructive. In other words, if I'm already building the wall, then there's nothing you can do but to help me with what I'm doing, so there's nothing that you can offer me, so why should I say yes? Maybe the reason, watch this, we find ourselves still frustrated is because we keep accepting the wrong invitations. You keep accepting invitations to contests where there are no prizes to win. Preach, Pastor. I'm doing the best I can. I I'm saying that Nehemiah declares, I can't stop this. I don't know. I ain't going there. I'm doing a great work. I'm building. God is developing something in me. I'm working on something. I am progressing. I am evolving. And I ain't got time to sit around and talk to people who ain't about nothing, going nowhere, and look for looking for nothing from themselves. Do I have anybody in the house who's ever seen 
somebody invite you to foolishness. I think we need to talk. We ain't got nothing to talk about. I'm good. I done talked to God. We decided we together, and it really doesn't matter what you have to say. Stop allowing people to pull you out of where God has placed you. Stop allowing people to push you into stuff that you ain't got no business making. Stop accepting invitations. Just let them know, I'm sorry, I'd love to come, but I got better things to do, like watch paint dry, watch grass grow. If it is taking you off the path toward your destination, then it is either a detour or distraction. Now, a detour is something that promises to get you to where you want to go. It's just going to take you a different way. A distraction is something that if you go there, it doesn't matter how far you go, you'll never get to where you're supposed to be. T tell somebody, don't do it. T tell somebody, don't go there. Tell them, don't go chasing waterfalls. Please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. I know you're going to have it your way or nothing at all. But I think you're moving too fast. I think you're, I'm sorry. I just got up in a TLC moment. Shout out to the 90s. All I'm trying to get you to see, br brothers and sisters, is that the adversary is counting on you falling for foolishness. But in the name of Jesus, don't take the bait. Don't fall for the okie doke. Don't let them push you, push your buttons. Don't get caught up in what they're trying to catch you up in. Don't get turned on. Don't get turned out. I'm here to tell you that you're in danger of distraction that will lead to your destruction. Preach, Pastor. So, they called him out, Tammy. Come meet us in oh no. He said, oh no. <laughs> Ain't going to get me. I'm doing a great work. Here it is. And I can't come down. Why should the work cease? In other words, he puts their invitation in the context of his purpose. And if they don't fulfill my purpose, then it has nothing to do with me, and I'm not interested in getting engaged in it. I'm trying to raise these kids. I'm trying to save this money. I'm trying to serve this ministry. And if you ain't on that list, we ain't got nothing to talk about. I'm sorry, we don't have anything to dialogue about. And here's what happens next. Watch the Bible. Don't read it too fast. The Bible says, but they sent this message four times. And I answered them in the same manner. Well, watch this. The devil is not as creative as he is consistent. He don't have a whole lot of stuff to work with. He just keeps trying to get you the same with the same thing day in and day, trying to catch the day when you're slipping. Are you hearing me? He's trying to wear you down over time. He's trying to catch you when you ain't been praying and you ain't been studying. You've not been in worship and you've not been using your gifts and ministry and you're spiritually dry and people have gotten on your nerves and, and, and you are disappointed and frustrated. He's trying to wait for your prime time to slip. That that's why he keeps coming back time and time again. And so, brothers and sisters, you've got to learn to practice no. Yeah, 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 okay. I said you got to learn to practice no. Well, repeat after me, no. You ever, you ever see what two-year-old when they figure out that word no? It's no to everything. Come on, get it. No, no. You want some milk? No, you want. Has it ever occurred to you that for the first 30 years of Jesus' life, he said no? For the first years of 30 years of Jesus' life, we see him do no public work of ministry and miracle. In fact, at the age of 30, the Bible says Jesus goes with his mother to the wedding at Cana, and after they run out of wine, she enlists her son's existence, which says to us that she knew he had miraculous power privately. He had just never shown it publicly because he had continued to say no. Can I say this to you? Can I say this to you? Can I say this to you? In the name of Jesus, you've got to learn to stop trying to be a people pleaser and stop trying to fix everybody else's life and save everybody else. Listen, Jesus says you introduced the to Jesus and then step back. 
Some of y'all are going to have a migraine. Some of you are going to have what my mama called a conniption. Some of you are going to have a heart attack worrying about that crazy child that won't do right. And they will not show up at your funeral because they were still caught up in some foolishness because you worried yourself to death about somebody who didn't care about themselves as much as you cared about them. You got to learn at some point to place a boundary. Look how quiet you got. You got to learn to say, guess what? I'm not giving up on you. I'm just giving you over to the hands of God because it's clearly outside of my coverage, and I'm going to let God work it out. May the Lord watch between me and thee when we're absent, one from another. Uh, maybe the reason, I feel like preaching today, uh, maybe the reason we're so easily distracted is because we don't know who we really are. We don't understand our worth. Remind, I'm going to remind you one more time, Nehemiah's re response to every time they send the same message, he gives the same response. Oh, no, I can't stop. I'm doing a great work. I Why should the work cease? In other words, he understands his purpose. He understands his value. And because he understands who he is in God, it will not allow him to engage in things that are beneath him, that are petty, that are not productive. And so I don't mean to go to meddling here in the message, but can I just ask you this question? Do you really believe that God saved you, filled you with the Holy Ghost, just so you could live like everybody else? You mean God gave you that intelligence and that access and that influence so that you could just live and try to acquire some stuff and kick it and do your thing and make sure your outfit is straight and go ahead and do some movies and some... No, I believe God has called you for greater. I believe God has called you for more. I believe that there's a kingdom purpose in the life of any in, every individual under the sign of my voice. And until you yield to that, it will be easy to get caught up in everything else. So, so, so the sinister, sinister call of distraction comes from Satan himself, and he don't just call once. In fact, can I remind you one more time, at the age of 30, the Bible says that Jesus has just finished his 40-day fast, and, and the devil comes to him and, and tries to tempt him, not once, not twice, but three times. Somebody say repetition. He's trying to pull Jesus out of his calling before he starts operating in his calling. But Jesus, every time the devil shows up, comes back to him with the word. And every time the devil tries to call him out of his character, he comes back to him with the word. Listen, you got to have some word in you to beat the devil who's trying to get you out of your purpose place in God. So here it is. Four times they call on the oh no. Four times he says to them, Oh, no. And now the Bible says the fifth time, then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. Huh. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us, ain't that some stuff, consult together. Right? So, so, so now, because they couldn't get him privately, they're trying to pressure him publicly by separating him from the people and discouraging the people. They done come up with a lie and put it on social to try to convince them to stop building the wall. Stop reading the internet, please. Anyway, the Bible says that, that now what they're trying to do is to come up with a lie that causes them to seem as if they're enemies of the king that authorized them to rebuild the wall to begin with. And, and you got to think how Nehemiah is in his feelings. You got to think about how fear is catching him because he knows if the king changes his mind, not only will the project be done, but he'll be done as well. You got to think about how he's feeling the fear that if the people catch hold of what they're trying to put out, then they're going to be discouraged and their hands are going to become weak and they're not going to be able to finish the process. You got to figure out how mad he is that somebody is lying and then something. I mean, I just don't get it because I ain't a liar. I just don't understand how perfectly 
capable people got nothing better to do than to use their imaginative process to create something that ain't true about me. But you have to resist the urge to lower yourself to the level of liars, and you got to learn to stand in integrity and trust that if you stand, God will fight your battle. I need about 200 folks in here that are witnesses to the fact that when people try to do their worst, God is at his best. And you don't have to lower yourself. He will raise you up. He will put a hedge of protection around you. He will cause people to speak the truth on your behalf. He will raise up angels and on their wings they will guard you and bear you up so that you don't dash your foot against the stone. Give somebody a high five real quick and say, neighbor, I survived it. Because God was faithful. Go ahead and get a good night's sleep. Go ahead and stop worrying about it. God is going to work it out. God is going to take care of it. God is going to make your enemy your footstool. He will even prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy so you can have a good meal in their face. Give somebody else a high five and tell them, I think it's dinner time. Keep your kingdom focused. You ever notice every time I come up here, I say kingdom, and y'all say focus. You ever, you ever wonder what that's about? It's about the fact that when we first founded this church, I knew that there would be more needs that I wanted to meet than I could meet. And if I tried to do everything that was good, I would miss what was God for us. And so, and so every time we say kingdom focus, it's a reminder to me to stay fully committed to the specific mission that God has called and sent me to. And I want to encourage you every day the Lord allows you to wake up in the morning, you ought to say kingdom focus because I know the devil got something planned this day to try to get me off my agenda. The devil got something planned this day to try to distract me from what God has called me to do. But in the name of Jesus, I want to stay kingdom focused. Proverbs 4 says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. In other words, if you just stay focused, you're going to get what God has for you. If you keep your eye on the prize, if you keep the big picture in mind, if you stop confronting with petty people and stay where God has you, you don't have to worry about the blessing because the path that God has prepared is already blessed. Have you ever noticed how when, when they got those horse-drawn carriages, they put the blinders on the horse's eyes? Now, he's not blind. He can see ahead. He just can't see to the left or to the right. Now, you go to New York City. They got them horses pulling them carriages. You know, there's all kinds of stuff happening in the streets of New York. Uh, and they know if they let the horse look everywhere, they'll never get to where they're trying to go. He'd be looking at the cabs over here and the bikes over here and the people over there. But if you can just get some blinders, then you can lead him where he needs to go. Touch somebody and say, neighbor, you look like you could use some blinders. You look like you caught up in everything. You scrolling your life away. You shopping your life away. You, you up into everything, trying to do everything with everybody instead of staying focused on the things that God has for you, forgetting those things which are behind and straining toward what lies ahead. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Stop worrying about all that stuff. When you seek him first, he'll add it. He'll give it. Blessings will overtake you. Come on, I feel like preaching. Give somebody a high five and say, keep your kingdom focused. Adam and Eve got distracted. They had a focus. They had a purpose. They were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. They were supposed to exercise the minute. But instead, they got caught up, ate from the wrong tree, and we ain't been the same since Noah got distracted. He was supposed to be restoring the world after it had been washed through the flood. But instead, he got drunk and then exposed himself and ain't been right since. The Bible says that Saul got caught up. Instead of following the commandment of God, Saul got so caught up 
up that God regretted that he made him king because he took his focus off of what God told him. David got distracted. He was supposed to be out on the field in war, but instead he was at home, woke up and saw a sister across the way named Bathsheba, and they done messed it all up. Y'all not hear what I'm saying? Solomon got distracted by having wives and concubines and compromised his character. Y'all getting quiet. Adam Clayton Powell got distracted by his appetites. It's Black History Month, and all black history ain't beautiful, but it's still the truth. Winnie Mandela got distracted by her desire for power. Biggie and Tupac got distracted in the East Coast, West Coast rivalry. Michael, Whitney, and Prince got distracted in drugs. Y'all getting quiet. Bill Cosby and R. Kelly got distracted. If we're going to tell it, let's tell it all. There's too much stuff out here. No matter how much money you have and power you have and fame you have, that if you don't keep your hand in the hand of God, the devil will destroy you. The devil will take your weaknesses and use them against you. Lord, keep me in the hollow of your hand. Give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, I've got to keep my kingdom focused because sin is the devil's desire to use a legitimate need and meet it with an illegitimate answer. But in the name of Jesus, I want to keep my eye on him. I want to lift up mine eyes into the hills from which cometh my help because all my help comes from the Lord. I got to get out of here, but give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, get your head back in the game. Stop watching the crowd. Stop going back and forth with your teammates. Stop criticizing the coach and just play the play. Do your role and trust that God will get you the victory. Who am I preaching to? Is there anybody here that knows the devil has been trying to distract you, to destroy your purpose? But in the name of Jesus, I'm getting my focus back. I'm getting my right mind back. I'm getting my spirituality back. I'm getting my swag back. I'm getting my prayer life back. I'm getting my praise back. Is there anybody here that's glad to be back? Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. The Bible says that Nehemiah declared, Lord, strengthen my hands. I see what they're doing, but Lord, strengthen my hands. They're trying to weaken the hand of the people, but Lord, strengthen my hands. And that's all I come to tell somebody, that when you keep your focus on the things of God, God will give you more than you can do on your own. One more time, give somebody a high five and say, neighbor, come on, say neighbor. God will give you strength to do what you can't do by yourself. He will strengthen your hand if you keep your focus. Ecclesiastes said, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it, do it, do it till you're satisfied. Do it till God is glorified. Do it till the devil is horrified. Do it till the church is edified. I wish I had somebody that would strengthen your hands. Come on, open up your mouth and tell God I need you every day. I need you in every way. Lord, keep me day by day while I run this pilgrim race. Say yeah. Say yeah. 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 Come on, stop looking around. Stop comparing yourself. Stop competing and look to the hills and lift up your eyes and focus on God and watch him work it out. Watch him make a way. Watch him put the devil on the run. Watch him provide. Watch him protect. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he be a bridge over troubled waters? Won't he put food on your table? Won't he keep a roof over your head? Won't he make the enemy leave you alone? Won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he? Hallelujah, 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 
Hallelujah, nigga. Some of y'all can't even get free in church because you watching them and you watching him and you watching her. There's no man or woman that has a heaven or a hell to put you in. Stop focusing on them and focus on him, the author and the finisher of your faith. He's Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Say yeah. Everybody, everybody standing, everybody. Everybody standing all over the building, wherever you are. Don't get nervous and don't you dare leave. God's got some work to do right now. God's got some business to handle. And here it is. It's all about your focus. It's all about your focus. It's all about your, your focus. Isn't it amazing? what you can do when you really give your all to something. How is it that we want overflowing blessing and we giving God half-hearted attention? The Bible says you shall love the Lord your God with some of your heart most of your heart, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Just imagine. Look how good you're doing now. Half stepping. Can you imagine what you and God could do if you just gave him your Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying for all right now. For somebody to truly sell themselves out to you. God, we've sold out to so many things, so many people, and they've been unfruitful. It's been painful. So, God, in the name of Jesus, help us to divest from the things of the world that we might invest ourselves fully in the kingdom of God. God raise a generation of real disciples, not, not just Christians on paper, not just church people on Sunday, but folks that will seek your face rather than just your hand. Folks that have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Folks that will study to show themselves the proofs. Folks that will delight themselves in you. Because God, you declared when we delight ourselves in you, then you would give us the desires of our hearts. So I pray for all right now that we might give ourselves fully over to you in Jesus' name. Now, God, I pray for somebody who, who, who's never made an all commitment. They've not made a commitment to you. They're, they're unsaved. They're unsure. They've never accepted Jesus in their heart as their personal Lord, Lord and Savior. They've been caught, caught up in the world. But today, God, you want to rescue them and bring them into the kingdom. God, bring them forth at this invitation. Allow them to say yes to this kingdom invitation so you can change the rest of their days, both on earth and in eternity. God, I also pray for those who are saved, they're Christians, they're believers, but they're spiritually homeless. They don't have a church home in the DMV where they're growing and getting stronger in the gospel. God, I pray that you'll bring them forward as well, that they can put their roots down in this ground so they can grow in the spirit. Bring forth the harvest for our good and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. No, God, she'll 